early 1970s, Pablo Escobar flew a Piper PA-18 Super Cub aircraft filled with white powder from Columbia to Miami, Florida, just one of many shipments to come. Decades later, he was responsible for smuggling 80% of the snow shipped into the U.S. But how did he manage to do it? Let's find out. 1960s. Colombia had yet to really enter the white powder trade. Brazil, Chile, and Argentina were the top dogs back then, and coke as a whole wasn't even popular in North America. But by the 1970s, it became a lucrative market, raking in billions of dollars. Now Pablo Escobar, who started off as a common car thief and then a kidnapper, became one of the very first Colombians to exploit the white powder market. But unlike other drug lords of his time, Pablo was one very smart man. He found a way of smuggling coke from other countries into Colombia. And when the shipment arrived, he had a team of expert chemists refine it and then give his mules to smuggle it into the US. This was the trickiest part because when Pablo started his white powder business around the 1970s, he didn't have so much coke to smuggle. So his mules smuggled coke by swallowing condoms stuffed with the product or stuffing a few kilos up there, you know where. But anyway, as Pablo's market began expanding, he needed new ways to move his product. And that's where the idea of flying the PA-18 Super Cub aircraft came into the picture. This light utility aircraft with 150 horsepower was carefully selected by Escobar, because it could fly at low altitudes, meaning it could go undetected by US radar. 1977, the first aircraft shipment of white powder happened with Pablo Escobar himself on board. He carried 250 kilos of coke from northern Colombia to the Bahamas. From there, two men that worked with Pablo, Carlos Letter, and George Young organized a transshipment with another aircraft into southern Florida. This single shipment was worth $15 million, Pablo's first big hit in the white powder trade. From there, Pablo continued shipping between 300 to 500 kilos of white powder from his ranch in Colombia to the Bahamas. It was easy money for Pablo and he expanded his market once more. He built a lab near the Venezuelan border to refine and cook the white powder. This lab had around 200 employees who lived in small houses on wheels. This lab also produced about 5,000 kilos of white powder per week. Just imagine how much money that generated. But that's not even the best of it. Beneath the houses was a landing strip for Pablo's aircraft. The idea was that when an aircraft radioed its arrival from a shipment, the houses were rolled away to reveal the landing strip for the plane. And then whenever the plane took off for a returning trip, the houses were rolled back. It was genius. He didn't need anything else. All the production and transportation were done in the same area and no government had a clue. Until something tragic happened. Drug War 1978, Pablo Escobar decided to monopolize the white powder market in Colombia. He ignited the drug war in Colombia by hiring sicarios to murder white powder smugglers in rival cartels. This was obviously a very selfish move because the market was big enough for everyone. But I guess he wouldn't have been the greatest drug lord of all time if he didn't do this. The drug war lasted from 1978 to 1981, and this was the time Pablo also opened a new drug route into the US. His associate, Carlos Letter, bought an island called Norman's Cay in the Bahamas. This island was over 5 miles long, so it allowed multiple planes to land on the 3,300-foot airstrip before taking off for the United States. Carlos made this island his home. There was a warehouse for storing up coke a hotel, a restaurant, residences, and a marina. And with the help of Escobar, Carlos was able to bribe the Bahamian authorities to surround himself with 40 armed German bodyguards and, of course, host some of the wildest parties filled with so many beautiful women. However, as smoothly as things were going, the DEA began picking up signals of Escobar's aircraft flying into Miami. They traced where these planes were coming from and found Norman's K as the main hub of the white powder shipment. They intercepted a few of these aircraft and seized hundreds of kilos on board. Pablo Escobar heard about this and decided to switch things up. Pablo knew his planes were the main target. So once they left Norman K for Miami, he had men parachute the white powder cargo into the water where his speedboats transported them into Miami. So whenever the planes were intercepted by the DEA on their arrival, they wouldn't find any white powder. This worked for a few months until U.S. Coast Guards began intercepting the speedboats as well. 
but a very smart Pablo Escobar had a plan C. To transport his cargo, he used miniature submarines that went undetected. So no matter how much the DEA tried, Escobar shipped about two tons of white powder into the US each week. At this point, Escobar was making about $5 billion worth of profit per week. It was massive. But Pablo Escobar wanted more. Heavy lifting 1982, Pablo Escobar's white powder smuggling into the US was at its peak, and the Medellin cartel was very well established. He began using DC-3, DC-4, and DC-6 planes to move his product. These cargo planes were huge and could move about 80 to 125 tons of white powder to the United States per trip. And as if that wasn't enough, Escobar bought 13 Boeing 727s from a bankrupt airline to also transport coke. And just for context, these are real commercial planes, so imagine how big and fast these bad boys moved. Each plane could make two trips in a day, and he had 13 of these. They were bringing so much money in for Pablo, but also drawing a lot of attention to the Bahamian government. A special team of the DEA, the FBI, and the Bahamian government drove Carlos off Norman's K Island, bringing a stop to their major shipment route. But Pablo's cousin, Gavidia Rivero, opened a new supply chain for the Medellin cartel. First off, he began substituting legitimate cargo shipments into the US by replacing their parts. He replaced things like the insulators and refrigerators, the inside of televisions, and the rims of tires with white powder. Then they mixed white powder with Guatemalan fruit pulp, Ecuadorian cocoa, Chilean wine, and Peruvian dried fish. They even soaked it in blue jeans, which was removed by chemists upon arrival in the US. So no matter how hard the United States tried, they couldn't stop Pablo Escobar. But these methods weren't sweeping in as much cash for Escobar as he wanted. So he decided to establish a new route. And that route was through Haiti. The Big Bank Deciding to move the product through Haiti to the US was the best idea for Escobar and his enterprise. It was more cost effective and was raking in a lot of cash. Each pilot was paid about $400,000 per trip and on some days, the planes were abandoned on the coast of Florida with pilots swimming to waiting ships to make their return to Haiti. From Haiti, Pablo Escobar began using Panama with the help of dictator Manuel Noriega. The idea was to move the product to Panama, then from there Pablo's couriers in Mexico would transport it across the Mexican-US border, pushing about 145 tons of white powder into the US market. This also helped the Sinaloa, Juarez, and Tampico cartels that have since turned Mexico into another hub of white powder and drug activities. But that's beside the point. The point here is that Pablo Escobar was pushing in more white powder than the US market could consume. A kilo of white powder was costing about $1,000 to refine and then $4,000 to smuggle to Miami. While Escobar's agents over in the US were selling a kilo for as high as $50 to $70,000, and each plane was making five to seven trips in a day. As crazy as that sounds, this brought two big problems for Escobar. One, there was white powder everywhere, so the price per kilo dropped drastically. And two, there was too much cash to launder. Pablo Escobar is the only man known for having so much cash that he had no idea what to do with it. The influx of cash was so much, Escobar's accountants had to store the paper bills in bins, the holds of ships, secret compartments under swimming pools, and in the walls of houses. These guys were spending about $2,500 every week on rubber bands to keep the wads together. And you might be asking, why didn't they use banks? Well, Pablo didn't like banks, and besides, his money was illegal, so a bank wasn't an option. When they lost $5 million by placing the cash on the wrong ship, Escobar made the statement, eh, you win some, you lose some. He didn't care, because that money was nothing to him. And to tell you how crazy the cash inflow was at the time, Pablo Escobar lost about $500 million each year to rats and rot. Now that's a lot of money, even for Pablo Escobar. So to reduce how much money he was losing, he bought a Learjet to smuggle his cash out of the US. This luxury jet was used by Hollywood celebrities in the 80s, and owning one was a status symbol among the rich and powerful, equal to having a standard private jet today. But for Escobar, it was a mere means to transport his money down to Colombia.
Beginning of the end. As white powder became an epidemic in the US, the government stepped up its war on drugs, wiping out coke sellers from the streets and pressuring Colombia to capture the drug kingpins. This meant tighter security at the borders and stricter consequences for anyone found dealing with white powder. But once again, Pablo Escobar revolutionized his shipment of white powder. He stopped using aircraft, speedboats, or land vehicles. He began using submarines. He purchased two remote-controlled Russian submarines from the Russian Navy. Although these submarines could only carry a ton of white powder each, they made multiple trips in a day. However, the end was near for Pablo. He made the Forbes list as one of the top 10 billionaires in the world for seven straight years. In 1989, Forbes estimated his net worth to be around $24 billion, which I bet was a lot lower than the actual figure. His fortress and residence over the years, Hacienda Napoles, covered 2,226 hectares with a Spanish colonial mansion, six swimming pools, stables for racehorses, gardens, orchards, 14 artificial lakes, a zoo with over 2,000 species of animals, and a full-sized football field. It was so big, people probably lost their way around. But all his power and success got into his head. He grew a dark side. A dark side that wanted to rule the whole of Colombia by becoming the president. His famous slogan, Plato Plomo, meaning silver or lead, was a demand for allegiance. He killed over 60,000 judges, policemen, rival cartel members, and anyone who dared step in his way. His excesses were way overboard, making the DEA, the Colombian government, the search bloc, and a group of paramilitary wanting Pablo dead or alive. It was a war he couldn't win. So he surrendered in 1991 to a luxury prison he designed and built near his home in Medellin. But a year later, Escobar escaped from that prison as authorities arrived to move him to a secure jail near Bogota. Two years later, and a day after his 44th birthday, Pablo Escobar spent too long on the phone with his son, allowing him to be spotted by a Colombian police lieutenant. He was then cornered by several hundred members of the armed forces and shot dead as he tried to escape through a rooftop. In the minutes after his death, a policeman shouted through his radio 